have to be supergravity. Has an SL2R symmetry acting on the fields in the following way. So it sends tau to A tau plus B divided by C tau plus D, where tau is a complex field. It's a combination of the Raman Raman zero form and the Dilaton. Um, and uh, we defined an SL2R matrix lambda with entries A, B, C, and D in SL2R. Well, the two forms act, uh, transform like a doublet. So we define B as a combination of the Ramon Ramon two form and the Neva Schwartz Neva Schwartz two form. And we saw that under this SL2R transformation, B gets shifted to lambda times B. Now, so in a quantum theory, this SL2R symmetry is broken to SL2Z by uh, charge quantization. So in quantum theory, SL2R is broken down to SL2Z. And we have all uh, seen SL2Z before, namely it is the group of modular transformations on a torus. So if we have a torus with the following shape, given in terms of a parameter tau, tau one plus i, tau two, then we can obtain the, uh, the same torus if, for example, we take tau to tau plus one, so this would be an SL2Z transformation acting on the torus and we, we, get, uh, we get the same torus if we identify opposite sides. Now, since there is this similarity, one may wonder if there is such a geometrical interpretation. Oops, uh, actually, just use two blackbirds. Uh, one may wonder if there is actually a geometric interpretation for the um, SL2Z transformation of type 2B, and actually there is, and this is what I want to explain today. So to do that, uh, what, I, what I'm going to um, what I'm going uh, to do is to um, uh, present a um, to present a certain solution of type to be string theory. And then we are going to consider the following background: e to the phi divided by two, which is type to be string theory compactified to four dimensions. And we have some internal space. specified by a metric GIJ. Now, so let's call the space over here X. Now, we are going to, um, and I've included a factor of here of the Dilaton because this is the string frame metric and the thing in the bracket is the Einstein frame metric. Now, so um, uh, let's denote this uh, space with X. We are going to consider first, in order to find the interpretation of SL2Z, the case when tau is constant e to the minus phi. So we are going to take this to be constant. And in this case, x, uh, if it, is, it can be a Calabria threefold, and this leads to a solution with n equal to two supersymmetry in four dimensions. Now, this restriction that tau is constant is actually not really necessary. And in order to get a supersymmetric solution, and we are going to give that up in a moment, and we are going to get extra mileage out of having a solution with varying tau. But to find an interpretation of the SL2Z, this is good enough for now. So we are going to assume at this moment that tau is constant. So.
Now let's relabel one of those space-time coordinates there, x3, as w2, and why I call it w2 will become clear in a moment. And we are going to periodically identify. So we are going to take one of the non-compact directions and we are going to make it a circle. So we are going to identify w2 with w2 uh, plus the pi. Then what we want to do is to t-dualize the solution to type 2a. T-dualize. Well, we all have learned how to do that. Um, so we have a metric over there. We have a specific solution that has a metric. It has a Raman Raman zero form and it has a dilaton. We apply the Busha rules that we discussed in detail yesterday and we obtain the type 2a background. So we obtain a piece that is um, describing three uh, non-compact directions. The metric on the compact direction gets inverted. So we get a factor minus phi divided by two. Nothing happens to the metric of, on the space x. Now the type 2a solution is going to have a dilaton that again we can obtain applying Boucher rules. And the result we get is a type 2b dilaton uh, to phi and this factor here coming from the metric. Now since there's a zero form over there, we are going to generate a, a Raman Raman 1 form in type 2a. with a component now in the W2 direction. So now remember what we discussed yesterday, namely that if we have a type 2A solution um, then and lift this to M3, then the dilaton, the Ramon Ramon 1 form, and the metric, all of them are going to lift to the metric in 11 dimensions. So this means if I take that type to a solution over there, I lift it to M3, I'm going to get a background specified just by geometry. So there's going to be no, um, no three form flux. Lift to M3. Again, so that's something that we learned yesterday. We saw that there's a, the way to obtain an 11 dimensional metric in terms of the uh, type 2A metric was the following. We assume that the, that the 11 dimensional metric is a circle bundle fibered over some um, 10 dimensional metric that in this case happens to be the type 2A metric up there e to the um, Now, let me rel um, call the um, 11 to 10 circle coordinate. I want to denote it by W1 because of a reason that will become clear in a moment. And as we discussed yesterday, the Raman Raman 1 form appears over here as a gauge field. Well, of course, now it has only components in the W2 direction. Okay, so we know all the data and now it all boils down to doing a small computation. And the 11 dimensional metric one gets is the following, minus dx0 square plus dx2 square. dyj. So this is three-dimensional Minkowski space. This over here is our space X, which at this moment still is a Calabria threefold. And then we get this piece here um, that now contains the W1 and W2 coordinates.
And I use the fact that C1 has components only in the um, W2 direction. Now, so this doesn't look very illuminating until one realizes that one can rewrite this using the result for tau, namely tau again is tau1 plus i tau2 is C0 plus e e to the minus i e to the minus phi, and then one can rewrite this matrix as one divided by tau two dw one plus tau dw two square, and one immediately recognizes this as a metric on a torus if we have the uh, uh, if we have the identifications that w i are identified with w i plus two pi. So this means the M3 metric we get <coughs> plus tau d w two square. This is a Calabria threefold for tau constant. So this is the metric on a torus that has um, complex structure tau is equal to tau one plus i tau two. And um, it turns out that this uh, torus has an SL to Z symmetry acting on it. So the metric, metric, on T2 is invariant under SL to Z transformations, which take tau to A tau plus B divided by C tau plus D, um, up to diffeomorphisms, which are up to diffeomorphisms, which is in this case are a labeling of the coordinates of the torus which respect the discrete identifications. And the relabeling is A minus B minus C D. Which respects the discrete identifications. WI is identified with WI plus two pi. But now remember that this parameter tau is exactly the axial dilatum of type 2b. So this is, so tau is c0 plus i e to the minus phi. So this is the same, let me call it maybe this way, the same tau. So the SL to Z transformation acting on the type 2b fields is nothing else but the SL to Z transformation acting on the torus. Now, um, how does SL to Z, um, acts on the tensor fields, remember that the two forms, they transform like a doublet, can be understood now by decomposing the three form. So SL to Z acting on, well, on two forms and on the rest of the, the tensor fields can be understood in the following way. So in M3, we also have the um, three form, C3, and we can decompose it into objects that have uh, components in nine dimensions in the following way. So this would be a three form that has components in, in nine dimensions. Um, there is one part of C3 that is a two form times DW1. 
another part that has, uh, and the components of the two form are also in nine dimensions. Um, another two form times dW2 plus B1, um, a one form times uh, dW1, uh, which dW2. And now it turns out that, uh, so if we go, if we go to uh, first, so this is the M theory three form written in terms of uh, quantities with indices in nine dimensions. So if we are in type 2A, this one corresponds to the type 2A three form. And if we then do T dualize to type 2B, this becomes the four form with one index in the W2 direction. W1, remember, is the 11 to 10 circle. So from the type 2A point of view, this is the NS, NS2 form with indices in two dimensions. So if I t-dualize in the W2 direction, this becomes the B field in type 2B. So this over here are the corresponding type 2B quantities. Now this one, this quantity is from the type 2A point of view still a three form, right? Because the 11 to 10 circle is W1, this is still a, a three form. So if I T dualize in the W2 direction, this becomes the Raman Raman two form of type 2B. And this over here is going to give me off diagonal components of the metric. Now it turns out that um, C3 should of course be invariant under this uh, SL2Z transformations acting on the torus. So this means that if I perform that diffeomorphism over here on the coordinates of the torus, then I want this object over here to be invariant. So C3 should be invariant. Under SL to Z, which means that um, uh, which means that C and B, the Raman Raman two form of type to B and then SNS two form, so this is Raman Raman, this is an SNS, should transform as A B C D C two B N S. And the remaining fields, C4 should be invariant. As well as the Einstein frame metric, like for example, GIJ. So, and the Einstein frame metric is also invariant. And that's exactly the way um, the SL2Z transformation acts on the field uh, as we defined it a moment ago. Questions? So this is the geometric origin of the um, SL to Z symmetry of type to B. As I said a moment ago, um, so we have assumed to do this computation that the space X is a Calabria three-fold and the tau is constant, but that is in general not necessary. It is possible to show, then we can use this to introduce some fun new solutions that um, one can also construct solutions in to be with instead of n equal to two supersymmetry, n equal to one supersymmetry in four dimensions um, by giving up the condition that has constant. So in that case, we would still have our type to be metric like this. Now, um, we 
would still have um, our type to be matrix like this, but in this case, we can actually give up the condition that this is a, that this is a six dimensional space. So we can erase this, and this can be an n dimensional space. N dimensional. Um, Kähler space, so the conditions that, we have, that have to be satisfied is x is still Kähler. Now, it's not going to be a Ricci flat. Um, then the parameter tau, the axial dilaton, has to be holomorphic. Um, so it will depend on, so tau, I should say, depends on the coordinates. Tau is going to be a function depending on the coordinates of the uh, space x only, depend, and it's going to be ho a holomorphic um, function. So del bar is something like dyi del by dy. So since it's a killer space, we can introduce this complex coordinates. So tau is a holomorphic function of the base coordinates. And there is, um, so the space X is not Ricci flat, but the um, Ricci form, we call it maybe curly R, is equal to del del bar log of tau 2. Remember that this is a two form, the Ricci form, defined in the following way for a complex space, dyi, which dy j bar, which in this case can be shown, to, well, since the space is scalar, it can be shown that this is equal to del del bar log of the determinant of the metric of the scalar space. Now, um, again, so I've not specified the, um, I've not specified here the, um, the dimension of the space, so that can be, uh, that can be an n-dimensional space, and it turns out that the solutions with varying tau, they also have the name, they are called f theory solutions, so solutions. With tau non-constant are also called F3 solutions, which have, have been quite popular in the last um, few years to construct models for phenomenology. Now, we can also get some extra mileage out of this by lifting the theory back to M3, this type to be solution. Now, in the entire procedure I described a moment ago, uh, lifting the type to B solution to M theory, where I said that tau was constant, I really didn't assume any word tau to be constant, so I simply can, um, can use the same procedure even if, tau, if I have a varying tau. So I perform the same procedure, and then one obtains an M theory metric that looks in the following way. This is um, our space X plus one divided by, now it's going to be a tau two, depending on Y, um, but again, it has to be a holomorphic parameter, W2 square. So if, for example, um, we take the case that we have three complex dimensions, so this is a, or six real dimensions over here, 
Then, so we know that um, this uh, duality procedure that I've described, so that doesn't, uh, doesn't change the supersymmetry. So this means from the m theory point of view, we actually get a solution with an n equal to two supersymmetry in three dimensions. So, and it's an m theory solution compactified on this entire space. So this actually, so it's a compactification on a Calabria fourfold. Now, this Calabria fourfold turns out to be elliptically fibered, which means that there is a torus that varies in some way over the base. And this expression is what is also called um, semi flat approximation for the metric of a Calabria fourfold, which is sometimes a useful tool to have if we want to construct solutions, for example, using duality. So we would have here a concrete expression for the metric. So this is the semi flat approximation. to a metric on an elliptically fiber Calabria forefoot. Again, we have not, spe so in order to find the solutions, we don't have to specify the dimension of the space. So we could also play the same game and obtain M theory compactified on K3, where then this uh, metric over here would be semi-flat approximation to the metric of K3 that is also sometimes called the stringy cosmic string metric. Well, I mean, that's, I didn't describe this in too, much, in too much detail, but you would have to take the supersymmetry transformations of a type to be string theory and, and do the analysis, basically. So, so analyze what kind, of, what kind of solutions you have, and then you see if you have a varying tau, you have less supersymmetry than if you have a solution where, where tau is constant. So it works in any No, 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 you preserve super, you preserve supersymmetry. Sorry. So, so if you um, if you compactify on spaces, the counting of supersymmetries is specific to to the solutions over here with this amount uh, with this dimension over here. So, if I want to have n equal to one and four dimensions, then I should of course take the space to be uh, uh, the space to be six dimensional, right? And but if I have a different dimension, then I get different supersymmetry. But, but the, this uh, statement that uh, the varying tau breaks uh, some of the supersymmetry, so that is, that is true in, in general. Can you, say, can you say that it was broken by D7 uh, Or may, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's a way of saying it because this, this parameter over here, that, that is probably a good way of expressing this. So um, since this parameter tau, as I, Okay, I erased. Okay, this parameter tau is a holomorphic function, and uh, in, if it is, uh, let's say we, uh, for the simplest situation, we describe K3, so we would have a holomorphic function, and that, uh, that function, either it's constant, it's trivial, or it's going to have singularities, so, it's go so the torus is going to degenerate, and those are the points where, uh, for the interesting solutions where there are seven brains located, so the, those we would have to take into account if we have, if we have a varying tau. Yes? Sorry, that again. This, this manifold, you say the Calabria fourfold, right? But the entire thing, yeah. But X itself is not. No, 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 no. So the, this is a Kähler space, and it's not Ricci flat. So there's a condition on the curvature that I described over there. So, so the, the entire thing is Ricci flat, but not this. Right? And so, so you get the Ricci flatness of the entire thing by uh, using. Um, exactly that condition up there. So, because it connects tau 2 with, with the curvature of this. At the end, this, uh, this eight-dimensional space has a uh, Ricci flat metric. Yeah. Why, uh, so, what's the meaning of the word semi-flat approximation? Well, the meaning of the word semi-flat approximation, oh good, thank you. Thank you for the question, that's important. 
is that um, I, I so there's a subtlety, of course, in the entire story. Namely, I performed this duality procedure by t-dualizing the, 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 the torus. But this torus here depends on the coordinates of the base and it kind of singularities. And then one can ask what happens if one dualizes along singular fibers. So this is where this metric becomes only an approximation. So this is a good metric for the Calabria fourfold if we are away from the singular fibers. And uh, it has to be broken because we know Calabria fourfolds, they don't have, I mean, th this metric has isometries. Right, and Calabria forwards don't have those isometries, so they need to be broken somewhere, and they get broken exactly where the thing degenerates. So this is why this is a good metric for the Calabria forward away from the singular fibers, but not uh, uh, not not where the torus degenerates. Okay, so the next theory, the next theory that I want to introduce is, remember that we were uh, discussing low energy effective actions. The next theory I want to introduce is type one. Now, um, remember that um, the type one theory is left-right symmetric. Uh, excuse me. The type two B theory is left-right symmetric type to B is left-right symmetric. So which means if we, for example, look at the massless states in the NSNS sector that we constructed this way, as we discussed yesterday, so we have massless state from the NSNS sector, or we have the massless states in the Ramon Ramon sector, so the theory is left-right symmetric, which means if I have one state in the theory, I am also going to have the theory in which I exchange the left movers and the right movers. So it doesn't mean that the, all the states are invariant. It just means that if I have one state in the theory and I exchange the left movers and the right movers, it's going to be mapped into another state that is also in the theory, uh, particularly because the, the Ramon-Ramon sector um, is uh, both spinners of the, of the same chorality. So type to be is invariant on the watchsheet parity. To be is invariant on the watchsheet parity, which takes the uh, watchsheet coordinates sigma to, to pi minus sigma. So um, it turns out that one way of constructing the type one theory is to take type to B and mod out by omega, which means um, keep only the states that are invariant. So, uh, so in type two B, we take one state, we perform this omega transformation, and we map it to a different state. But some states are invariant, and those are the ones that uh, that we want to use to construct the type one theory. So, the massless states of type one from the NSNS sector. Remember that we decompose this product of vectors as a trace, something that is symmetric traceless and something that is anti-symmetric under exchange of i and j. So the dilaton, the metric, and the b-field, right? So these two are symmetric under the exchange of i and j. So this one's we keep. Well, this one over here gets projected out since it's anti-symmetric. <laughs> so.
also in the Ramon Ramon sector. Remember that we decomposed this product of spinners into 35, but with a self duality condition imposed, a 28 and a 1. This was the 0 form, this was a 2 form, and there is a 4 form. And uh, so if we change uh, the left and the right movers, we have to take Fermi statistics into account. So it turns out that C0 and C4 are projected out, and C2 is the one we want to keep. Now, um, if we look at the fermionic fields, so those arise from the NS, Ramon, and Ramon NS sector. Um, so in type 2b, we have uh, two gravitinos, two dilatinos, and so on. That we obtain like this. Let me call this, uh, introduce a shortened notation. This is psi 1. So these are going to be um, fermions in space-time. And this is psi 2. Well, it's obvious that if I interchange the left and the right movers, psi 1 plus minus psi 2 is going to be mapped to plus minus psi 1 plus minus psi 2. This means that only one combination of uh, gravitino survives. So as opposed to um, type 2b theory, um, type 1 theory only has n equal to 1 super symmetry in 10 dimensions. So type 1 has n equal to 1 super symmetry in 10 dimensions. Now, um, it turns out that just using um, this construction, the type 1 theory is not consistent. And now I have to use a few things that if you have seen that before, then, then uh, um, it will be easy to understand, but it may be a bit difficult. Maybe you can read about this a bit more in detail in the book, because it contains a bit a few things that I haven't explained. Now, so this procedure of modding out by omega introduces into the theory what is called an online plane. <coughs> so modding out out by omega introduces an orientifold plane that in this case is space filling online plane. And there's charge associated to this online plane, namely minus 16 units of the nine brain charge. So these are now facts that I'm not deriving, I'm just using. Um, but again, so you can read about this uh, in the book or uh, in references. So such an online plane has minus 16 units of D9 brain charge. And uh, it turns out that in order to have a consistent theory, we need to have uh, the background charge, the D9 brain charge, cancelled. So Q total consistency requires. Q total is equal to zero. So this means if we have one or nine plane, we have to, we have to add to this 16 D9 brains. Now, another fact that I'm going to use that I'm not deriving, um, again, so this is part uh, of the literature, is that on the volt volume of this D9 brains in the presence of an nine plane, there is an SO32 gauge theory. So if you have not seen this before, you can as well say, well, the uh, type 1 theory just based on the fields that we um, discussed a moment ago, just based on the dilaton, the graviton, and the two form, that theory is not consistent. It has anomalies, so one has to add gauge theory to this. Or you can do this analysis um, using, um, using total D9 brain charge. Okay, so this means that the field content of type 1, in order to get a consistent theory, the bosonic field content is the dilaton, the metric, C2, and SO32 gauge field.
Well, it turns out that this is not the only theory in 10 dimensions without field content. There is another one, the SO32 heterotic string. And well, um, people have constructed the low energy effective action for the SR32 heterotic string, and simply by looking at those low energy effective actions of type 1 and SO32 heterotic string, um, it turns out that they are related by the following map the dilaton changes sign, so the string copying constant gets inverted, and the metric gets rescaled. Now, so this is a fact that you can analyze from the low energy effective action point of view, so it doesn't sound uh, very mysterious. However, note that um, this first relation over here implies that the string copying constant of type one and of the heterotic string, so they get inverted. So if one theory is um, strongly coupled, the other one is weakly coupled. So this, uh, this, is, um, this is why this is a conjecture that is difficult to check. So usually in this situation, some checks have been done, and uh, so it has been conjectured that, so not only at the, low, at the level of low energy effective actions, but the, that the entire string theories are related uh, through this duality. So some checks have been done. Um, you can, for example, check that the tension of the D1 string in type 1 at strong coupling gets mapped to the tension of the heterotic string. So um, that is, for example, uh, something that is protected by supersymmetry and that we can follow from weak to strong coupling. Uh, but again, so this is something that is more difficult because it's strong weak coupling duality. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So the next thing I want to discuss are compactifications. Um, we have seen a little bit of that yesterday in the um, in the homework session. So. <laughs> Let me say a few additional words. And let me go back to the issue of moduli fields and how to stabilize those by preserving supersymmetry. So again, so one possible way to make contact between string theory and the real world is to take the heterotic string on a background like this. dimension and Minkowski space. And this over here, let's say, uh, space X. So if we want a supersymmetric configuration with n equal to 1 supersymmetry in D equal to 4, one solves the condition that the supersymmetry variation of the fermionic fields is equal to 0. Now, one possible solution is um, H3 is constant. So, um, so as we just discussed, the heterotic string also contains a, also contains a two form, so it has the same field content as type one. So one possible solution is H3 is constant 
far, uh, eight three zero, excuse me, uh, the Dilaton is constant and there's a covariantly constant spinner on the internal space. So this implies that X is color BR threefold. Now in this case, uh, we get all this moduli in the four dimensional theory. So I will not have time to describe those in detail, but again, as we saw already yesterday in the homework session, this can be illustrated. So many things can actually be explained for a Calabria one-fold instead of a Calabria three-fold. And even the simplest one, just with a square torus like this, where we identify opposite sides. Let's say this radius is R1, this radius over here is R2. So then, in this case, we have the parameters specifying the shape and the size. So as we have seen yesterday, actually for a torus that is a little bit more general, a T duality exchanges these two parameters. So this would be the example of the complex structure. And this over here would be an example of Keller structure. Now, in this example, it's also possible to um, find a representation of this parameter tau that can later be generalized to Calabria threefold. That is quite useful. So let me mention it because I think Melanie is going to use this in her discussion. Um, so we can define A cycles and B cycles on this torus. And so it would be something like this. Maybe this one is the A cycle. This one over here would be the B cycle, and we can define a holomorphic, um, a holomorphic uh, one zero form. Then this object tau, the complex structure, can be written as integral over the A cycle of omega, right? So we get R two divided by integral over the B cycle of, um, of omega. So that is, that is our representation of tau that again, so later can be, can be generalized. Now, um, so this uh, procedure of um, compactification, what it's going to do. So imagine now that we take string theory, we compactify on such a torus, we get these parameters like tau and rho lead to massless scalar fields. Now, um, they have a normalization that is non-standard. And as you can easily verify, again, so this is homework exercise in the book. Um, this parameters, uh, you may want to do that for the more general torus, the one with the angle. So, the, uh, so after compactification, On T2, tau and rho appear as um, scalar fields with only a kinetic term, and this kinetic term is determined by a killer potential that happens to be, in this case, integrated over a torus. So this is the killer potential for tau, and the killer potential for rho would be integral over, uh, let me write the more general case where we have an angle, in which case this would be the complexified killer form B plus I, J. So J, J is the killer form related to the metric. So again, that's um, homework that you can, that you can um, uh, do on your own. So, so if you want to. Now, so this idea generalizes to Calabria three-thirds. This is why I'm mentioning this. Um, so for the case of, but everything is just a little bit more complicated for Calabria three-thirds. Here we have one complex structure parameter, one killer structure parameter. For Calabria three-thirds, we have a bunch of these fields and they're labeled, let's say, by a uh, index alpha. 
which is given by the Hodge numbers of the Calabia threefold. So these are some numbers that characterize the number of harmonic uh, PQ forms, so one, two forms in this case. Um, so this would be the complex structure. And Keller's structure would be parameterized by number of harmonic 1-1 one, one forms. So that would be Keller's structure. Now, as we saw yesterday, um, for the case of the torus, T duality in one of the directions interchanges rho and tau. Now, so this has been um, conjectured also to maybe be, a, um, let's say, a, a motivation or maybe a proof for, for mirror symmetry for Calabria threefolds. So this goes under the name of SYZ conjecture. So let me sketch in a very impressionistic way how this works. Um, so, so interchange of tau and rho. So that would be T duality. It exchanges complex structure and Keller structure for Calabria three folds. This is conjecture to lead to mirror symmetry. And there is a again so some um, proof. due to um, Strominger, Yao, and Saslov that works in some situations, but, uh, uh, but only in some of them. So the idea, the impressionistic description of this is the following. So imagine that we take type 2A compactified on a Calabria threefold like this. So we have a certain space that has a certain topology. Then we can BPS states. We can obtain BPS states by, or one BPS state by placing a D0 brain on a Calabria, D0 on Calabria threefold. So this would be a BPS state since it preserves supersymmetry. So then the mirror symmetry conjecture would tell us, well, if we compactify type 2A on a Calabria threefold, we get a four-dimensional theory. There must be a Calabria threefold that I'm going to call um, Calabria tilde that may have a different topology like this. Right, and the conjecture is that I, if I compactify type 2A on this space, the four-dimensional theory should look the same as if I compactify type 2B on the, on the mirror manifold. Um, then we can ask the question, well, how could we, um, how could we obtain this D0 brains on the, um, on the type 2B side? Well, in this case, we would take, um, so what can we do? We have to take brains and type to B. Well, uh, type to B, as we have discussed, contains brains where P is odd. Now, so we want to get a D0 brain, which is a point-like particle, so it has, um, it's point-like, but it has a time dimension. So which brains could we take? We can, for example, say we take a D1 brain that has one time and one space direction. We wrap it on a one cycle of the Calabria, and we would get such a state, but that doesn't work. Um, simply because it's a, such a Calabria 3 for doesn't have one cycle. We can try with a D5 brain, which would have one time and five space-like directions. We wrap five space-like directions of the Calabria. Well, it doesn't work either because B5 is equal to zero, so it doesn't have, it doesn't have any, any five cycles. So the only one that works is the D3 brain on three cycles. Now, it cannot be any cycle. It has to be a supersymmetric one. Right, because we want to get a BPS state, something that is uh, something that is supersymmetric. So, and this works because B3 in general for Calabria space is non-vanishing. So this means for this map to work, the D0 brain needs to be mapped to a D3 brain. Well, we already learned about how to transform a zero brain into a D3 brain, namely by doing T dualities, right? So, so transverse, uh, so in this case, if we do three T dualities, we can transform a D0 brain 
23 brain. So then they conjectured So the conjecture, S, Y, Z, is to say, well, the color BR3 for testing to be a, is, is a T3 fibration <coughs> over some base, some three-dimensional base, and we call this B3, and so the operation of exchanging the manifold and the mirror, so mirror symmetry, would then be equivalent to T three T dualities, three T dualities on T three, which is sort of um, a nice idea because this. Um, um, ex I mean, that's exactly what mirror symmetry does, is it changes the complex structure and the Kähler structure. Um, and it worked so well for the, for the toros, this operation, and for, so that, that is sort of the conjecture they have. Um, it's a nice idea. Again, uh, there are subtleties, of course, because this is in general a vibration. There can be singular fibers or what happens, for example, in situations when this is not a T3 vibration, but this is, this is sort of the idea. So one of the, one of the ways people have tried to um, show that mirror symmetry is true by using T-duality. So I thought I mentioned that since we discussed yesterday in so much detail how T-duality acts on, a, um, on the complex structure and Kähler structure parameters of a in principle, it could. I mean, it, it, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. It, it could, in principle, because the D2 brain could wrap a supersymmetric two cycle and then also give rise to the D0 brain. I think that's possible. So, this is the simplest situation. Okay, now, so we have seen how to, um, how a compactification of string theory leads to, um, leads to um, all these moduli fields. And the next thing I want to explain is how these moduli fields can become massive, how to include flux in compactifications while preserving supersymmetry. Now, we are, of course, interested in compactifications to four dimensions. Um, and uh, uh, however, the example I want to present um, actually deals with compactifications of M3. M3 to three dimensions. Um, and the reason for this is everything is simpler in M3. So there are less fields, the spaces can be compact, we don't have to include brains, etc. cetera. Um, other backgrounds, like for example, um, let's say to be on four dimensional Minkowski space times a Calabria three fold with flux can be obtained, or maybe any other space doesn't have to be Calabria 3 for even T6 or whatever, can be obtained applying the duality between type 2B and M3 that I already explained a moment ago. One can even use uh, some of the dualities I explained to transform the M3 flux backgrounds to flux backgrounds for heterotic strings, so heterotic strings on M4 where they lead to interesting new spaces that are not Calabria spaces but torsional ones. So 
So in this case, we could, for example, transform the M3 background to a type 2B background. Uh, we can apply a duality chain to obtain a type 1 background, and that is as dual to a background for the theoretic string. So this can be um, actually this duality can be performed in very much detail. But all of the spaces are very complicated. So the simplest one is actually appears in M3. So let me explain how fluxes generate potentials for modeling fields. So remember the 11 dimensional supergravity action. Now, one solution to the equations of motion, which happens to be supersymmetric, is well, one that looks like this, where this is a Calabria fourfold, this is 3D Minkowski space, and G4 is equal to zero. Okay, not very exciting. Now, for a Calabria fourfold compactification, um, again, we have the formations of the, of the metric, so variations of the Calabria metric give rise to um, a complex field. So, if we deform the complex structure, we get complex fields T, which now are labeled again by the Hodge numbers, but in this case by H, H31. So again, number of harmonic 3-1 um, forms. And the Keller structure, structure um, uh, deformations lead to real fields, Ki. And again, we have a bunch of them labeled by the topological data of the Calabria fourfold, so we get all these massless fields. Now, and without flux, this, uh, these parameters are arbitrary. However, it turns out that in general, um, G4 is equal to zero cannot be, um, uh, cannot be uh, the right solution. And the reason for this is, remember, there's this eight derivative term. So there's an eight derivative correction to the M3 effective action, which is some, that is the membrane tangent, so it's some constant, C3, watch X8. Remember that this uh, um, did contain four powers of the, of the Riemann tensor, so I'm not going to write this object again. Now, this object modifies the equation of motion for G4. And now I'm, go I'm going to use this fact that I mentioned a moment ago that everything is simpler in M3. Namely, we can construct flux backgrounds by assuming the space is compact. It's going to be non-singular and there are going to be no explicit brain sources. So which means that I can take this equation and simply integrate it over the Calabria fourfold. Like this. So, since there are no explicit brain sources, the left-hand side of this equation is equal to zero. And on the right-hand side, now I'm not going to uh, keep track of the factors anymore. So on the right-hand side, um, so the left-hand side is G4, which G4, the right-hand side is, as we have seen in yesterday's class, the integral of X8 over the Calabria fourfold is the, uh, the Euler character, so there is sort of proportional to the Euler character of the Calabria fourfold. Of Calabria fourfold. So well, this in general will be non-vanishing. 
So in order to make sense of this uh, compactifications on Calabi-Yau forwards with non-vanishing Euler character, we need to include flux in the compactification. So even though this term X8 there uh, is subleading in the derivative expansion, we see that it actually plays a very important role because it changes the properties of the solution, right? So um, once we have a non-vanishing Euler character, we have to take flux into account. Now, um, a supersymmetric solution. So once we take flux into account, a supersymmetric um, background with G4 non vanishing. So we go back and we analyze the supersymmetric conditions and we find the following result. So supersymmetry is satisfied if the background takes the following form. So now we have to include a warp factor in our metric. This is our three-dimensional Minkowski space. This is still our Calabria forefoot, but now we have a warp factor here. So this is no longer a direct product, but it's a warp product. So delta is a scalar function depending on the coordinates only of, uh, of the Calabria forefoot is the warp factor. There is an external component of the flux. So, so that's the metric. There's external component. So which means G4 flux with indices in three dimensions. Let me denote those with uh, Greek indices like this, given by derivatives of the warp factor times a volume form of the external space time. So this is the volume form. And there's an internal component, which means with components only on the Calabria forefoot, internal component. And in order to preserve supersymmetry, it needs to satisfy a few conditions, namely um, the four zero piece and the zero four piece are equal to zero, the same for the one, three, and three, one piece. So the only non-vanishing component is to two, and it is, but sometimes it's also called primitive. So this over here, J, is the killer form of the Calabria forefoot. Now, it turns out that um, I've written a solution there with a warp factor in there in the metric and in the external component of G. Um, but it turns out that if we, if we are only interested in finding a supersymmetric solution, then delta is not determined. So supersymmetry, supersymmetry does not determine mean delta, so we can check the supersymmetry constraints and do anything we want with delta, it's not, it's not determined. But now you also have to remember that um, solving supersymmetry conditions alone is not, um, is not enough to find a solution of the equation of motion, so delta Fermi equal to zero, we have to supplement this with a Bianchi identity to also find a solution of equations of motion. Now the Bianca identity I want to impose is the one on the uh, seven form, which would be the equation of motion for C3. So Bianca identity on the seven form with this, the dual to G4. So D G7 is equal to G4 plus X8. Now I'm going to be a, a bit sloppy here with the constants. Um, now, Taking 
the external component of the flux it's possible to show, so this is a little bit of algebra that I'm sure everyone can do, that uh, this Bianca identity reduces to, um, and I'm going to take certain components of, the, of this equation, namely um, the ones which involve on the left-hand side the external component. Um, so the left-hand side reduces to something like this. So this is the Hodge dual on the internal space, so on the Calabria fourfold. Um, plus x8. Now we have to use another fact that I discussed yesterday in class, namely, remember that the metric on the internal space, once we have the warp factor, actually has this factor of delta of one half in front, right? So in principle, it could get very messy. Um, but it turns out that this object is conformal invariant. So any dependence on this warp factor drops out. So we get, for the warp factor, we get an equation which is, uh, if you want, maybe of Poisson type. So it, it's like a Laplace equation with a source on the right-hand side. Which we can solve. So this star is a Laplace equation, equation which is solvable if the integrated equation is satisfied, and again the integrated equation was that this has to be proportional to the Euler character of the um, of the Calabria fourfold. Now, so this condition is actually, um, now we play the same game again. We take M theory, we compactify on the space, but now in the presence of flux, and it turns out that this flux uh, generates potentials for the moduli fields in three dimensions. These potentials can be obtained oh, very, let me actually mention how this works pretty schematically. So what's, what's the magic? Why, why do fluxes generate potentials for moduli fields? Well, because remember that there is, so very roughly the idea is, um, once we have background flux, we need to include also, and we do a compactification, we need to include this term over here. And if we do a dimensional reduction, and this, so we have background flux, and this um, kinetic term for the, for the four form in 11 dimensions contains the metric, right? So it contains the metric of the Calabiao space in here in this, in this hot star. And it contains the metric in a non-derivative form. So this is how potentials for moduli fields appear, so, so without, without derivatives. Now, I'm not going to show the details, so let me simply claim that um, once this uh, procedure of dimensional reduction in the presence of flux is done, one can show that there are superpotentials in three dimensions which appear, so in 3D, in 3D. Um, compactification with flux. Leads to potential for moduli fields. And this potential can be written in terms of two superpotentials. Now, so now I'm going to use a few facts about special geometry. If you have seen this before, um, it's not difficult. If not, I would have to go back to the example of the torus and so on. So I don't have time to do that anymore. So let me go over this now then real quick. Um, so there are superpotentials generated in the, in the three-dimensional theory. And 
the condition for unbroken supersymmetry is that W and the derivative of W with respect to the fields, in this case complex structure fields, are equal to zero. So supersymmetry conditions are that W is equal to zero, which implies that G4, that the four zero, and since it's real, and zero four piece of G is equal to zero, and the derivative of W has to be equal to zero, where um, this is the derivative, so it's the killer covariant derivative with respect to the fields parametrizing the complex structure deformation, so alpha is equal to one to H three one, now, it turns out, again, so I'm using now a bit of information of special geometry. If you have seen it, you feel comfortable with this. If not, well, I don't have time to explain this anymore. So, the deriva so this derivatives of the holomorphic form um, form a basis of harmonic 3-1 forms. which means that this derivative being equal to zero implies that the three one piece is equal to the one three piece is equal to zero. And there's a, a second superpotential defined for the Keller structure moduli that looks like this. Again, so unbroken supersymmetry uh, so, in solutions with a vanishing cosmological constant implies that this is equal to zero, so this leads to the primitivity condition, that this is equal to zero, and W equal to zero. So, that's no further constraint. And it turns out, so this again, once uh, one is given the superpotentials, one can construct a corresponding uh, potential for the scalars. Keller structure um, fields or uh, fields parametrizing the scalar, uh, scalar structure deformations are hidden in here. Complex structure um, deformation parameters are hidden in, um, or the fields corresponding to them are hidden in omega, and this is the way one generates potentials. So there's one uh, last type of solution that I want to mention. Namely, um, in this context, one can also construct solutions which break supersymmetry and have a vanishing cosmological constant. One can show that the um, equations of motion are, one minute. <laughs> One can show that the equations of motion are satisfied if all the data of the background are not changed, but G4 on the internal space, so this would be the internal component, is self-dual. So this means one can find solutions of the equation of motion which look in the following way. It can be a primitive to two form, so with this I denote uh, something that is primitive, so. So that is something that is self-dual and satisfies the supersymmetry constraints. But here are objects, so this is some function, let me simply call it g0, so that's a constant function. So this is self-dual, but doesn't satisfy the primitivity condition, for example. So that's the solution that preserves supersymmetry, and that over here is a solution which breaks supersymmetry has and still has a vanishing and still has a vanishing cosmological constant, so a solution that solves the equations of motion. Well, that's what I wanted to say about the um, 
uh, how to generate potentials for moduli fields, and this is all I will have time uh, to tell you about. Well, I had fun teaching this class. Um, hope you had fun listening. Thanks for listening. And I will be around this um, afternoon if you have questions, either about class, about homework, or about anything. I suppose if there are any immediate questions, we can start. <laughs> I ca uh, oh. Why they appear in those multiplets? Uh, nothing that comes to mind uh, this quickly. <laughs> More questions? Oh. All right. Yes, right. So is this analysis self-consistent? Well, I mean, um, so it would be, it would be interesting to take those additional eight derivative terms into account. So that's, that's, a, that's a very good question and see what happens. Yeah. So they are not known at this moment. So the same holds for type 2B solutions. I have one important analysis 